The first steps in server penetration testing are always hard. In a world full of tools, packages, and commands, where do you actually start? Well, in this video, I'm going to start from the first steps of reconnaissance and make my way to a full exploitation of a Linux server. Now, covering all the concepts that goes into hacking Linux servers is a lot. So this is not going to be a one single video covering all those concepts. Instead, this is going to be a series of videos. And for this first step, we're going to cover the reconnaissance, the first vulnerability scanning, and some exploitation techniques. The techniques and exploitations that you're going to see are not going to be limited to one tool. We're going to have to use a variety of tools. So embrace yourself and let's get started. Now, the first step in reconnaissance is to make sure that our server is running. And for that, I'm going to ping uh, my server located at 236 on my network. And we can see that the response time is low and the server is responding. So that's pretty good. Next up, we will have to see which ports are actually open on the server. So I'm going to start a very basic in map network mapping uh, command that will check which ports are running on this server. This scan is pretty fast. We've got a big list of ports. We've got an FTB and SSH, some telnet, um, HTTP ports as well are open. This is pretty good because this means the server has actually a lot of capabilities for us to cover. And, but that also means a large surface for attacks. But did we actually cover everything on this server? So does this list actually cover every open port? Well, the answer is actually no, because by default, Nmap will scan the 1000 most used ports. So if we want to make sure that we didn't miss some ports because some self-defined services, for example, will not use a standard port. So what we will have to do is define the range of ports that Nmap will scan. And for this, I'm going to define it to be the maximum range of ports. So from zero to 65,535. And now you'll see we've got actually a different list. So you can see we've got some unknown ports. The beginning is also is kind of the same because they are known services. But let's actually compare how much indifference did we did we find. I'm going to save the results of the default port scanner to a text file. And I'm going to save as well the results of the complete scan to a file. And then I'm going to count the lines in both files and see if there's any difference. Let's start the counting. So we're going to use the word counter. We're going to use the minus L to count the lines. And the first thing that we're going to count is the port uh, is the default scanner. And so we've got a total of 30 lines. You should remember there's some headers and some output at the end. So we've got around maybe 25 ports that are open. However, when we look at the complete scan, we see that the results have 37 lines, which mean that we've actually missed seven open ports when we didn't scan the complete list of the ports. Now, another thing to notice, if we look at this complete list of ports, it's only covering TCB. Like an FTB is also TCB. We've also got some x11 vnc all of those connections are mainly tcb based but there's also another type of connections the udb and we're not actually capturing this by default in network mapper so we need to reapply and actually change the scanner to scan for you for open udb ports now the command that we've used is equivalent to this minus small st T stands for TCB, and we don't want that anymore. We actually want a UDB scan. So we're going to uh, change this T to a U, and then the, actually the Nmap will search for open UDB ports. We also need to increase the speed of the search, and that's something we define by this minus T. I'm going to go for the highest speed because my server and my client are now very close to each other, so I don't need to wait a long time for the reply to arrive. Now, if you go for a scan of the full ports on UDB, this will take a long amount of time. I'm going to actually stop it now and go for a faster version where it will only scan the default ports that accept UDB. Now, in, other, in cases when you're trying to be thorough, don't do this. Actually go for the full uh, range of ports scanner on UDB as well. All right, I'm going to start the scan now without the range of ports. So it's only uh, set to the default ports. And you can see that we've found a, a large number of ports. However, most of them are closed. And a couple of them are open, but that's already pretty good. So I think in total we found uh, five or six ports that we missed in the TCB scan. So now we actually have a complete image of what's going on on this server and where we can actually connect and under which protocol. Uh, the next step in penetration testing is to actually go for some vulnerability scanning, the automated parts. And for this, we're going to use Nuclei. Nuclei has some templates especially made for networks. So I'm going to use those templates and I only have to provide it with the uh, IP of my server. And voila, 
It has spit a total, I think, of six vulnerabilities that it has found. There is an FTB-based vulnerability that it has found through its network scan. It's a very critical vulnerability on port 21. Now, we've also got a bunch of other vulnerabilities that were detected. For example, we've got an open SSH with an outdated version, SSH 2.0. We've got a VNC server. We've got some Samba. And we've also got an SMB v1. Let's start with the exploitation. Let's exploit this FTP server. But first of all, what is VS FTP? Well, let's look it up. It's an FTP server that's actually by default installed on Unix-like systems. So you can actually rely on the fact that it's might be available on any server, but we can actually exploit this vulnerability automatically with Metasploit because it has a special backdoor command execution module that we can actually use on the fly and we don't even have to write our own script for it, which is a big plus because it speeds up the process. I'm going to start my MSF console over here and you can see on the left a list of all the open boards that I've got. An MSF console is simply a terminal, so you can still you still have access to all the commands that you have in a terminal. When you want to use a specific module, you have to start with use, and then you have to provide it with a path to that module. However, how do you actually find that path to the module? Well, there is this uh, website where you can search for um, any keyword, and then it will basically provide you with the module path, but that's one way to find it. I'm going to also show you another way later on. So you need to first start with use and give it the path to this module. And then you're actually in this module. So you can hit show information and that will give you a lot of information about this module. For example, this module is speci specifically made to exploit a malicious backdoor. And it will give you also some more information about the options that are included in this module. So always make sure to check this one out because you also need to pay attention to the required options by MSF console. Now you can also just focus on the option by hitting the show option uh, BART. So we need to find the R host, which is basically the target of this attack. So I'm going to start from that. Now, once you've defined this host, all that's left is to hit the run, which will actually start the attack on this host. You can see it has established a connection to this IP. It found a shell but we still don't have access to it yet. So that will take a moment. And now we're actually in a command shell session. So what you can do right now is literally interact with the server as if you have a shell inside it. For example, you can do an LS, see which fo um, folders and files are available on this directory. We can check the currently working directory which is just the, the main mount point. I'm going to go into the ETC because that's where you can see all the passwords of the system. You've got the shadow file and the password files. They both include encrypted um, passwords, unfortunately. So, but they are still useful for us to know what the usernames are. But either ways, we've already got a shell using this um, exploitation. So we kind of we can already do whatever we want on this server here. We need to find also other ways for attacking this server. So we're going to go now into the SSH attacks. Let's check out which modules are actually available on Metasploit for SSH. We see there's this SSH login module that we can use. Now I told you there's another way to search and that's literally by typing search and then the keyword you're looking for, which will give you all the modules that are available with this Word. So I've searched here for the SSH modules. You can see a long list of all those modules. And there's a module called SSH login, which will basically brute force the login information for this SSH client. So we're going to use this module and then check out which options we actually have to define for using it. Now, the most important options in this list are the following. You need to define the host, so the target, number of threads, which will give you how many sessions there are. The user password file is very important. This is basically a file containing a list of usernames to try. The user file is one of the most important things to define. This is a file with a list of usernames to try for the SSH login. Remember, this is a brute forcing technique. So we kind of have to define it to give it a list of all the available usernames and all the passwords that it should try it with. I've already defined uh, the usernames and the passwords file. You can see them. They are in this folder under passwords.txt and usernames.txt. I'm going to set the passwords file to the passwords.txt and the usernames file to usernames.txt. I'm also going to pass it the target for this attack and start the run. So it will start the brute forcing. Uh, it will open a 
number of sessions, SSH session, to try those usernames and passwords. And once it succeeds, you can see that it will list it under success. It will give you the username and the password. Now let's move on to the next level. Now Telnet is basically the same thing as SSH, so there isn't much to do there. I'm going to start by exploiting the SMTB server. So I'm going to search for all the SMTB module. If you're not familiar with the word SMTB, it's the standard mail and transport protocol. So this is the mail server. Now there are many modules here. Some of them are specially made for WordPress. So we're not actually interested in that. Others are for Windows. So we're also not interested in that, but we've got some scanners. So we've got some user enumeration, enumeration utility, which will allow us to see which users are actually relying on the server. And we've got some open, open relay detection and some SMTB version script that will tell us which version of this mail server is running. I'm going to start by checking the version of the SMTB server, which is just by using this module and defining the target host. You can always check it out by showing the options and it will automatically connect to board 25 because that's the standard board for SMTB servers. Now I'm going to set the host and run the attack. And we can see that it's an SMTB 220. It's a SMTB boss fix and it's running on Ubuntu. That's some pretty good information to start our uh, exploitation if we needed a specific version to check for specific vulnerabilities. Now I'm going to move to the other module, the user enumeration utility. Now what this will do is we'll literally launch a verify. All SMTB servers allow a verify command, which will allow you to verify whether a user is actually part of this SMTB server. This will allow us to find the usernames on this server. Now, if we look at the options, we see there is the R host, just like usual, the board is default to 25 still, but the most important part is this user file, which is basically a list of usernames to try. So we also still need to provide it with a list to try. It's a brute force mechanism, just like the SSH module. Now this will take a while. Once it's finished, you will get a list of, of all the users on this email server, which is super good for penetration testing. Lastly, we're going to attack the DNS server, which is running on board 53. Whether it's actually working or not, we can run an NS lookup to ask it to find the IP of google.com using the DNS on our target server, the IP address for google.com. Our goal for this attack would be to change this IP address to something else. So preferably not the real google.com IP address, but maybe a an attacker controlled website. Now I'm going to look for modules that will allow us to attack DNS. So we've got the Bailiwicket domain and the Bailiwicket host. We're going to start from Bailiwicket. This is the Kaminsky attack. What this will do is basically poison the cache of the DNS to serve our IB instead of the default IB. We will have to provide it with a bunch of options like the new DNS, so where it should actually start connecting to, uh, the domain to attack. I'm going to set the new DNS to my IB and I'm going to also set the host to the attack. We also need to define the source port. Now, which source port is this? This is a very important step to pay attention to. The DNS server that we're connecting to will make a connection to the authentic server. So the server that is actually responsible for holding those DNS records. So what we need to find is the port that the DNS server uses to connect to those authentics. In my case, I had to run Wireshark on my machine to see where the DNS server on my target was connecting. And then I'm going to use that to set, to set it as a source port. You can leave it as zero to automatic, but that doesn't actually work. Now, once you've set the source port, you can run the attack. It will take a while because you have to try to poison the cache. If it works, you will get something like this. That example.com was actually poisoned. And now it leads to my IP address instead of the real IP address. Now you can, re uh, you can repeat this operation to basically any domain and make sure that it leads to any IP of your choosing instead of the real IP of the website. Well, that was everything I wanted to talk about. Thank you so much for listening. And remember that those techniques are mainly meant for penetration testing. They are basically the first steps. Those attacks will get more and more complicated as we progress through this series. So make sure to stay tuned and see you next time.